Hello. This video will introduce the Young equation. The Young Laplace equation introduced a pressure difference between two fluid phases, but didn't in fact necessarily involve a solid at all, so there was no multiphase flow in porous medium. So let's put in a solid. So imagine we have a flat solid surface like this. Okay, that's solid, and we'll label that with an S. Okay, and now we're going to have, as usual, our two fluids. We'll call this phase one, and we'll call this phase two. And we can imagine that at the contact, called the three-phase contact, where the two fluids hit the solid, that there's a balance of forces. Now, this is a bit of a conceptual leap because we've introduced interfacial tension as an area per unit area, uh, of an energy per unit area. But we use the units of tension of a force per unit length, and it is literally like a tension. So we can imagine that an interfacial tension between two fluids is trying to minimise that area. But there's also an interfacial tension between the fluids and the solid. So there's an interfacial tension between phase one and the solid here, and an interfacial tension between phase two and the solid here. And so what you can imagine, for instance, if phase two is air, and this is, for instance, a quartz surface, so it's an ionic surface where all the bonds have been broken, that it wants to cover that surface because it's a high energy surface. You can imagine this literally as something that's pulling the contact to coat that surface. On the other hand, this interfacial tension, this energy per unit area, is pulling back. So there's a force balance. Okay. So we can imagine this as a force balance, and if we do, the force balance is relatively straightforward. If we define a contact angle, theta, which is the angle with which phase one and phase two hit the solid. Traditionally, the contact angle is measured through the denser of the two phases. So if this is water and air, it's measured through the water. If it's water and oil, it's measured through the water. OK, so a force balance is fairly straightforward here. So this is a force balance. There's an interfacial tension between phase two and the solid is the interfacial tension between phase one and the solid plus sigma cos theta. Now, this is not really used to find this contact angle theta. It's more a definition of where it comes from. It comes from a balance of interfacial energies of the surface covered by the two fluids. In reality, we have to measure this contact angle. And the beautiful thing is, with three-dimensional X-ray imaging, we can look inside rocks and we can see the fluids and we can measure this contact angle directly. But this simply defines theta, or a contact angle. If you think the derivation seems a little strange, in fact, you can do it from conservation of energy. So the Young-Laplace equation was conservation of energy, where we introduced one phase. We're injecting phase two to displace phase one, and then we converted PDV work into interfacial energy. The Young equation can also be derived if we have a fixed volume of fluid, and then we arrange that fluid in contact with a solid in a way that minimizes energy. But it's a much more complex derivation. This is just a one-liner. The other thing that people often ask is, well, I can see the horizontal force balance, but what about the vertical force balance? Um, that doesn't seem to be matched. Remember, this is a solid. So there is a force upwards, and so the solid will deform slightly. And by slightly, I mean at the subatomic level, and that will provide the downwards force. If instead we have three fluids in equilibrium with a three-phase contact line, we do actually have to have um, both a horizontal and a vertical force balance, and we come across that when we look at three-phase flow. But when it's a solid, the solid stays more or less flat. So this is the contact angle. Often you see derivations 
where this is called a wetting phase and this is called a non-wetting phase, but we don't need to make any assumptions about the contact angle. Generally speaking, if this contact angle is less than 90 degrees, or in radians pi over 2, then phase 1 likes the surface. Right? You see that phase 1 is attempting to cover the surface, so this is phase 1 is, water, is wetting. And if this is water, we would call this water wet, right? So it's phase one is the wetting phase. And if the contact angle is greater than 90 degrees, and there's nothing stopping us having a contact angle that's greater than 90 degrees, there's nothing curious or unusual about this, then phase two is wetting and phase one is non-wetting. So examples of something that would be wetting is water, for instance, on this glass that I'm writing on. The water would like to spread out. It will have a contact angle that's considerably less than 90 degrees. So there, water is the wetting phase, air is non-wetting. But that's not the only case. If I were to spill some water, for instance, on a tabletop, a tabletop that's been varnished or made out of plastic, in fact, the water would form a droplet on the surface, okay, like that and the contact angle would be greater than 90 degrees. And in fact, in that case, the water is non-wetting and in fact easily runs off as a droplet. In fact, you've designed the surface to be like that. Okay, so you can have any contact angle. Essentially, theta is a contact angle that can have any value between 180 degrees and zero. And indeed, this is what we encounter in natural situations, it's something we simply have to measure, and we can now, as I said, measure even inside a porous medium. What we're going to do now is an example using both the Young equation and the Young Laplace, and indeed the example we started with the previous video, which was our beaker with a thin cylindrical tube say with water, this is phase one, say water, and phase two that could be oil or air, and we have the fluid rising up, and this was a height h. And as we discussed in the previous video, the pressure in phase one must decrease as rho gh, just as it increases as rho gh with depth. But now we'll assume that phase two also has a density. So at a height h, if we assume that this is a pressure P naught, say atmospheric pressure, where the pressure between the two phases is zero, so that both phases have the same pressure. If we go up h, then the pressure P1 is P naught minus rho one, that's the density gh. P2 is P0 minus rho 2 GH. And so my capillary pressure, PC, which if you remember is P2 minus P1, okay, is, we can write that as delta rho GH, where delta rho is the difference in density. So it's rho 1 minus rho 2. OK, and that's a Greek row, not some stranger P, right? That's a Greek row. So we know that's we know that's the capillary pressure. So how do we find the capillary pressure? So idea one is to use the Young Laplace equation. So what we do is we're going to blow up this picture and do a bit of geometry. OK, so let's just look at that meniscus really carefully. OK, it's like this. And it's part of a circle. So I'm terrible at drawing circles, but you can imagine there's a circle here, okay? And this has a radius of curvature, which we're going to call R. And this is going to be a radius of curvature in two directions because this is a circular tube. So we're going to say that our capillary pressure, okay, is 2 sigma over R because the two radii of curvature R1 is R2, which is equal to R. But we also know that the tube itself has a radius, which we'll call little r. 
Okay, so this is halfway through the tube. Okay, so this we can imagine is a right angle like that by symmetry, but now we need to introduce the contact angle, don't we? So the contact angle right, is this angle here. And this is defined, so this is phase one here, if you remember, right, phase one here and phase two up here. The contact angle is the angle at which this meniscus, okay, so the interface here has a technical word, meniscus, okay, at which the meniscus hits the solid here. So this is the tangent to a circle, and if you know that, that means that this is then a right angle, okay? So now we need to, to work out what the, uh, what the other angles are. So let's, let's do this carefully. The diagram always looks too small. Okay, so this is theta. This is 90 degrees. This is also 90 degrees. Okay, so if we look at this, what's this angle here? Okay, well, if we look at this here, if this is theta and this is a straight line, then this all has to equal 180 degrees. Okay, so this is 180 degrees plus theta plus 90 minus theta. So this angle here must also equal theta, okay? So if you can't see that immediately, you can do your own geometry, maybe with a slightly bigger diagram. So now we can use Pythagoras, or sorry, the cosine rule, that's actually quite straightforward, that the cosine of theta, okay, is r over r. So one over r is cos theta over r, and the capillary pressure is two sigma cos theta over little r. And this has got to equal delta rho g h. So the height of the capillary rise I can write using Young Laplace is two sigma cos theta divided by the radius divided by delta rho g. And in fact, this is something you can measure, and you can use this either to measure the interfacial tension, if we know the contact angle, which we could say by zooming in a microscope and actually measuring the contact angle, or doing it the other way around. If we know the interfacial tension and we know the capillary rise, we can estimate now the contact angle. So that's using Young Laplace. But actually, there's an alternative way of getting to exactly the same answer and in fact, in many ways, it seems a bit more fundamental because it uses the Young equation and just energy balance. So for those of you who found this idea of curvature and curvature in two directions a little bit obscure, let's just go straight back to energy balance. This is the equilibrium arrangement of this meniscus. And what that means is that it's not energetically favourable for the meniscus to move any higher. As it moves higher, it's favourable because phase one, which is more wetting in this example, right, rises up the tube more, and so it contacts more the surface. So that's good for surface energy. But of course, as it rises up, it's the denser fluid, and uh, there's an increase in potential energy. So it doesn't want to rise up. It doesn't want to rise down. It's exactly at equilibrium. So let's look at that equilibrium position, and let's balance a change in potential energy with a change in interfacial energy. So imagine that this interface were to move a small amount dr. What would be the potential energy of this little piece of water here? So consider that the meniscus moves up just a small amount dh and we're going to find the equilibrium between surface energy and potential energy. Well this little collar of fluid here has a volume, pi r squared, that's the cross-section of a circle, times dh. That's the volume, that's not the mass, okay? What we've done is we've introduced phase one and we've displaced phase two, so the change in mass for this volume is actually given by the difference in densities, okay? So that's a volume times a density 
right, which is a mass per unit volume. That's a mass. And then we know potential energy is mgh, isn't it? OK, so that's the mass times g times height. That's your potential energy. That's the potential energy that you have to add to move that water up. So that's not favourable. But it has to be balanced by something that is favourable, which is the change in surface energy. So now let's think about what has happened. Is originally we have a little collar of height dh and circumference 2 pi r. So 2 pi r dh. Can we imagine the area of a little collar? And that's contacted by phase 2. So that has an interfacial energy sigma times 2 times the surface. And then as the water moves up, we're going to find that the energy is lowered because the surface is covered by phase 1. So there's going to be a balance of energies, and we just need to get the signs right. So we can either say the total energy is zero, which is this, OK, plus this minus this equals zero, or you just make the two equal and you think about what's going to be positive. So if we want two positive numbers, this is clearly a positive number. This interfacial energy is greater than this interfacial energy. So we can make this equal to this minus that. Okay. So now let's go through that carefully and see if there are any terms we can cancel. You can see there's a pi that's going to cancel everywhere. There's a radius that's going to cancel. And dh is again, it's a dummy. Now we get an equation for h directly from energy balance. So we've got the h here. We're going to have a delta rho g on the denominator. OK, we're going to have an R on the denominator. OK, and then here we have 2, and that's sigma 2s minus sigma 1s. But hang on. What about the Young equation, right? Just to remember that Young equation again, phase 1, phase 2, theta here, sigma, sigma 2s, Sigma 1s, sigma 2s minus sigma 1s is just sigma cos theta. And lo and behold, I get the same equation here. So we can derive this equation both directly from energy balance and then using the Young equation or doing a bit of geometry with Young Laplace, which is a bit strange. You know, you think cosines and circles have nothing to do with just an energy balance, but the two give you the same behaviour. And when we're trying to calculate capillary pressures in complex geometries, it's actually normally the direct energy balance that we use. So I'm going to complete this video with um, talking about the people. So I've mentioned Young, Thomas Young. He was an English scientist who's actually famous for lots of things, probably things that you've heard of more than just the Young equation and Young Laplace. You've heard, probably heard of Young's modulus. Young's modulus is elastic properties of solids. What about Young's double slit experiment? Right, that's in optics. He also got close to deciphering hieroglyphics. He was, in fact, described as the last man who knew everything. That is, the last person who had such knowledge that it encompassed the the knowledge of the time. He published his Young equation in 1805. But you might say, well, you've got Young and Young Laplace. You're giving too much credit to Young. Who's Laplace? Well, Laplace ended his life as the Marquis de Laplace. He was a brilliant scientist and astronomer. And you're probably familiar with the Laplace transform, for instance. Right, in mathematics. We're not being unfair to Laplace. Laplace obviously was French. We're not being unfair to him because he has his own equation. Laplace's equation, del squared phi 
equals zero. So this could be a potential, for instance, in free space. So Laplace has his equation. So that's why we have to have Young. He has his equation and Young Laplace, where we combine the two. Um, the Marquis de Laplace was working at the same time as Young. At the time, the French and the English were at war, so they didn't actually work together. They just worked on similar things. The Marquis de Laplace didn't come from a noble background, because you might think during the time of the French Revolution, maybe he lost his head. Oh, no. Um, he came from a perfectly modest background, but was absolutely brilliant. He was appointed briefly as Napoleon's interior minister, during which time he tried to introduce a standard version of units, which we're now called SI units. And these are exactly the units that we're going to be using uh, throughout these videos and my course. So why is he a marquee? Well, with the fall of Napoleon and the restoration of the Bourbon monarchy, he was given this title later in life. Thank you very much.